Good afternoon. In a previous presentation on this channel, I talked about more of a script that was constructed for being able to construct time evolution and quantum computing. And as I had alluded to in that video, um, for one particular partial differential equation that I was interested in time evolving and constructing some potential wave function from as a starting point, I, I, you know, I alluded, you know, or I drew the attention of the viewer to the fact that there are still many other types of ways in which this code or this type of ideas or this way of thought could be appropriated from the code for looking at other nonlinearities. And in this video, I want to pursue that type of direction, namely demonstrating how wave propagation, which is one type of nonlinearity, which is really a rich and interesting area to explore different initial conditions and starting points of the algorithm, this quantum algorithm uh, can be very encouraging and how I was able to make use of this ideas or, you know, this way of thought for, um, for performing time evolution for different types of, uh, you know, um, initial conditions rather than the ones I stated in the previous, uh, you know, video on the channel. But uh, moreover, it really demonstrates how what we could expect in terms of what would be the expected runtime performance when we add noise to a quantum simulation. And I think that at the same time, unfortunately, this quantum algorithm and how long it can take to compile sometimes, obviously polynomial runtime, you know, and a very large one at that, um, could unfortunately prevent it from exhibiting exponential speed up uh, to uh, classical algorithm. So, you know, in the as in the previous case from the other script that I showed in the first talk, you know, that was similar to this, is that we're going to always start out by importing CERC, which again, like how I had alluded to and described to Google Quantum AI, they have a lot of great documentation and you can just print out um, a simple quantum circuit uh, after you've downloaded everything to make sure that it works. But rather than that, we also have to make use of the ansatz, which again, like how I mentioned, it was from um, it was from some really helpful code uh, from a colleague in the lab um, who he looked at very complicated ways to construct the ansatz, which is important. So even the ansatz and which object is used as an ansatz for some type of quantum simulation is very important. And it's still always an open direction of research, even taking something like this, like what I've been showing and being able to determine uh, different initial configurations in the Hilbert space that the time evolution could be carried out under and what would be the expectations and how would you code this up? And then, um, as we had talked about, um, when we're looking at the psi cost function, it's a cost function for the quantum state associated with the solution to the PDE under some well-posed initial condition. And then what we do here, like how I've done, is that in comparison to the CMPU of the quantum nonlinear processing unit for the Benny Luke equation in the previous uh, slide, or you know, the previous video, um, this one doesn't have as many expectation values. There were, recall, 161 expectation values that were given for that. Whereas for this one, because the nonlinearity space and the number of uh, terms that we're trying to optimize over from the statement of the PDE itself is much smaller, it makes it quite a bit easier. So it's pretty much like a fourth, 25% <laughs> of the expectation values of the cost function that was given from uh, the Benny Luke equation previously. But still, nevertheless, um, you know, sometimes when you have a lot of expectation values and you don't have enough budget on your optimizer, it can kind of force the optimizer to make very crude decisions about which types of terms it should optimize when it's in that are appearing in the cost function. So it just, uh, you know, it just goes to show that sometimes having some things in a simpler, you know, lower dimensional Hilbert space to start out with, um, can be easier to start out. And, um, <clears throat> A lot of this, like I had mentioned, is just really a way, a lot of ways to uh, just generate many different types of expectation values, which appear in the uh, cost function that I derive for the Kamasa home equation and uh, the preprint that I'll again uh, provide in the link to this video. And um, that cost function, it was probably like one of the more interesting ones because sometimes when you perform an optimization, there can be different ways to write expectation values as well as different types of prefactors which would be used to um, express expectation values that you're optimizing over for the cost function for some well-chosen initial condition. And um, the matter of the fact is that at least for this, uh, this cost function being simpler, it really gave 
you know, a really a sweet spot in terms of how many number of qubits add to specifying the ansatz, which could be run in some with some reasonable polynomial overhead that would then uh, be able to uh, provide some encouraging results. And as it's even shown here um, from the CMPU, I just build up the cost function. And then, like I had mentioned, it's just a little bit differently because of the way in which uh, the prefactors interact with each, with each one of the expectation terms, uh, which is appearing uh, within this return statement. So as you can see in comparison to the cost function for the Benny Luca equation, uh, this cost function, it's undoubtedly a lot more similar, which is reflecting uh, the lower complexity through the number of expectation values, which are appearing in a quantum circuit. But still, um, the complexity are different ways to test out um, different sectors, sectors, I guess we call, call it, or partitions of the Hilbert space. It really comes into play when you're looking to carry out the numerical experiments. And for this one, I really started out with like 5,000 time steps I have here, but really I even started out lower, like 250 or 500, just to see about which, namely, which aspect of the ansatz design would result in the solution fluctuating the most quickly within some small period of time. Because having that very high oscillatory behavior, it can be a little bit, you know, it can maybe require the most computationally speaking <clears throat> from a quantum algorithm because, um, <clears throat> because uh, what would happen is that the algorithm would have to pretty much oscillate between different classifications of maxima and minima at the respective, uh, you know, maximum or, you know, the peaks and the troughs of this type of sinusoidal or whatever oscillatory motion you're trying to be able to study further. So that's really a way that you can try to use like some intuition uh, from, you know, mathematically speaking to, you know, see about how different classes of initial conditions could be reflected in some more extreme behaviors of your algorithm in case like the quantum algorithm, and then how much time it would take, you know, how much polynomial time would it take uh, for the quantum algorithm to like, you know, approximate like the peak and, you know, the maxima and the minima and so on and so forth of different periods of the motion. So that's, yeah, that's what was really at least helpful for me in terms of trying to think about different ways to further scale up this algorithm for a more complicated time evolution experiments. And like I saw, like I said here, but um, I didn't maybe necessarily draw the attention to of it in the previous presentation was that you know, like I said, um, I kind of swept the fact that you have to start out the uh, optimization within a reasonable state in Hilbert space under the rug. And I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people in quantum computing seem to do that. And not just me, obviously, because, um, you know, uh, once you kind of it's, it's, it's kind of like once you kind of get how to adjust the initial condition or the initial state appropriately in the Hilbert space, you know, you kind of just have an idea for it. So like, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, what I would suggest to the viewer as someone who is maybe trying to appropriate these types of ideas or thinks of, or thinking of applying these different types of ideas within industry or academia is just like thinking more about, um, you know, thinking more about, um, you know, uh, which initial conditions would be favorable for the particular nonlinear problem of interest that you're interested in. Because, um, you know, for me, I would just like start out with like around like, uh, you know, ZGR parameters, like I said, the Zalka Gruko, uh, uh, Grokov, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the names, Rudolf, uh, Ansatz, and um, from whatever initial condition would be started, then I would just be able to perform time evolution. But undoubtedly, like I've mentioned, and I'll reiterate here, there have been just a lot of times when I ran the simulations that were kind of, you know, um, they were kind of, unfortunately, uh, you know, like they didn't, it was pretty much almost like a straight line for the entire time evolution from the solution. So if you get that type of result, it may either demonstrate, you know, the the presence of noise in the system that's preventing you from from being able to get some appropriate readout or measurement, or it could either demonstrate that you just chose um, a poor type of initial condition for the ansatz. And um, from the plotting section, um, I looked at different types of ways to visualize these solutions, and you know, again, it's just following the same type of way in which I'm describing how. I plotted the simulation PDF for the output for the Kamasa home PDE um, from one of them. And then, um, you know, I just superimposed the solutions in different types of colors. And I was really able to get um, very interesting oscillatory type behavior. So from that type of behavior, what just basically ended up happening was that 
I was able to, um, you know, control either the period or the frequency of the motion that was occurring in the uh, wave propagation of interest, as well as being able to make use of this result, um, these preliminary results and simulations to think about whether there would be any other types of nonlinearities of interest that could be interesting to look at further. And, um, you know, for this particular case in the script, you know, I really made significant use of the Nevergrad optimizer, which was an open source optimizer provided by uh, Facebook research, and uh, they use it for their own research purposes. So, you know, it's not like um, it's not like uh, it's never been used for anything before. But what happened was um, it was really helpful to make use of the open source Facebook optimizer, Nevergrad optimizer uh to uh, interface this with a quantum sim uh, circ uh, simulator. And this is just another part of the code that um, I also kind of swept under the rug, but people who are in quantum computing know it, that you just also need something to time evolve the wave function um, after you have uh, after you've um, initialized in whatever initial configuration in Hilbert space you have. And then, so again, like in these, I obtain the solution say wave functions. And what I do is that um, I allocate the solution approximations to each one of the solution arrays. So then that I'm processing this data forward within the classical quantum um, feedback loop as I've been describing. And then with the plot of the Nevergrad optimizer results, um, I'm demonstrating how numerically we can um, be able to arrange several types of more results together for visualization. And um, I these, again, were solutions with 5,000 time steps because that's just what I found more interesting depending upon uh, the ZGR parameters that I had um, that I had initialized uh, from you know the other method, uh, which could allow for us to experiment with different optimizer time steps as well as varying the magnitude of the optimizer step within the Hilbert space within each iteration of the quantum classical feedback loop. And um, for this one, um, I also wanted to draw the attention of the viewer to another method that I had also played around with and really experimented with, which was the time step. So like I had mentioned, time evolution in one of my other videos, time evolution is undoubtedly one of the most difficult aspects of quantum computing because you have to keep into mind or take into account um, how different aspects of the wave function could evolve with respect to time and potentially easily be susceptible to errors. So in this case, what I would do sometimes is that I would vary different types of parameters. Like in the case of the open source Facebook Nevergrad optimizer, I would vary the optimize, you know, the budget, which is the initial time or the initial, you know, an initial parameter that's passed to the optimizer, which really helps it determine how long it will spend, you know, how much of a polynomial, a fraction of polynomial time will it spend looking at being able to explore the Hilbert space and perform the computation for obtaining the desired maxima or minima, which just then throws the computation back over to the quantum side of things. And um, yeah, I just thought that that was also just something that was really interesting because when you're thinking about code, like, of course, like if, a, you know, if a pure mathematician or someone else is watching this, like it's not the exact same focus because maybe you could make use of these simulations to look at whether different types of initial data for some nonlinear system are well posed or not. But regardless, even if you don't, a lot of the still the same thoughts and the intuition when you're making a script like this or you're trying to study some type of biophysical or even physical or you know quantum mechanical system, for me, <laughs> I kind of I kind of see all these similar themes and other types of errors that I felt was uh interesting and helpful to, em to emphasize. And then um I just pass a different type of parameter for the onsets. You know, sometimes it can be helpful to pass to pass functions as parameters in the onsets so that we can just really obtain a strong localization about a fixed point within the Hilbert space after which we're performing after which we're performing the time evolution outwards. And then pretty much from this space, you know, the code is the same. You know, these were just this was just a script representative of a bunch of time evolutions I ran that were only five thousand time steps, but I even ran more like up to twenty thousand time steps also. And it was really helpful to look at, you know, how the structure of the code is and how I could pretty much reuse blocks of code 
and I change the parameters and change, you know, whether I'm using matplotlib or matplotlib 3D, like how it also mentioned in the other type of script video, which was helpful for uh, determining uh, which coverage of the Hilbert space I could get. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for watching.